Exhaust. And intake! Hey gang, I am super excited because this week I get to talk about one of my favorite things in the whole world. No, not reverse werewolves. I get to talk about your car's butthole, the exhaust. I also get to talk about your car's front butthole that sucks air in instead of pushing it out, the intake. So basically, we're gonna go over how air and gases flow through your car. Uh oh, did I just say flow? Somebody drop the beat, cause I'm about to bust the flow myself. Here I go. Oh no, I lost it. I'm sorry. If you wanna hear my sick freestyles, you're gonna have to check out my mixtape on SoundCloud, the Bart of rap. Yeah, I'm a SoundCloud rapper. Every time we film one of these, I spend 14 hours in makeup to cover up all my face tattoos. All right, now let's take a look at your car's reverse front butt. It's intake. The intake is how your car inhales and takes in the oxygen it needs. Some people might say it's like your car's nose or lungs, but those people are crazy. We've talked about how the engine's like an air pump, and the more air it can move, the more power it can get to the wheels. Leaders, cubic centimeters, and cubic inches are all measures of engine displacement. One way to think of it is how much air can get into and get pushed out of the cylinders. The intake manifold is a series of tubes that distributes the air coming into the engine evenly to each of the cylinders so that the right amount of air can mix with the right amount of gas. In a four stroke process, during the first stroke or the intake stroke, air from the intake manifold is sucked into each cylinder. The intake valves are then closed for the other three strokes, compression, combustion, and exhaust, and they reopen when the cycle starts all over again. The intake manifold makes sure that there's enough air available when the valve opens for each intake stroke, and that each cylinder gets the same amount of air as the other. Air is supplied to the manifold from the air cleaner assembly, which contains the air filter. Now, a lot of people write in to ask me if they really need to change their air filter. In fact, it's one of the questions I'm most asked. Anyway, moving on. You might have heard a lot of stuff about cold air intakes being an easy way to get horsepower. Well, let's think about that for a second. Cold air intakes move the air filter outside of the engine compartment so that cooler air can be sucked into the engine for combustion. Cooler air is more dense, and that means more oxygen into the combustion chamber. And that means more boom. The filters are usually moved to the upper wheel well area, or near a fender, where there's more access to free flowing cooler air and less hot air from the engine. They also increase airflow by removing the need for a box surrounding the air filter. Instead, they use large diameter intake tubes that are smoother, have fewer bends, and they're often wider than the factory ones. Removing the air box and using these bigger, smoother tube helps create an uninterrupted airflow. These types of high capacity swaps on their own don't really do much, because an engine's an engine. But if you got a blower or a car that you tuned or bored to get more power, then a high flow intake is absolutely necessary to get the most out of it. There is a drawback to putting the air filter in different places, like low behind the wheels where a lot of new cars have them. Sure, you get cool air away from the engine, but let's say there's a flood, then it pulls water in and it wrecks your engine. And that's why you see so many cars stuck in puddles on the news. It's also why off-road mudding vehicles got those periscopy type of things sticking up. That's their intake. If you're worried your engine's not getting all the air that it should, your car can let you know. This fixed OBD2 reader and app can measure airflow into the engine in real time. It gives you live data so you can optimize that intake. If you're not sure if you're doing right, they got videos and blog posts that explain issues and give you the next steps to getting your car running the way you want. If that's not enough, they just launched a fixed mechanic hotline provides unlimited access to an ASE certified mechanic for anything you need. And once the air goes through the engine, we gotta get rid of it. As I said earlier, the exhaust is like a car's butt. Your car produces some harmful gases, but they go through your exhaust system and get cleaned up and go out your tailpipe. Just like how your body produces harmful gases and then your butt cleans them before they go out of your butthole. Also, I really don't know how the human body works. I just figured out what these things are the other day. They're my hands. They can be used for all sorts of jobs. No engine runs completely efficiently. As it combusts fuel, there's gonna be leftover dirty bits that exit as pollutants. Gross. Some amount of fuels is gonna be unburnt, partially burned, and that's gotta be quickly processed out of the fuel through the exhaust to make room for the next cycle of combustion. The exhaust first exits the engine and enters the system through the exhaust manifold or exhaust header. 
It collects the exhaust directly from the engine. Each opening mates up with one of the engine's exhaust ports with flanges that form a tight seal to prevent it from escaping. Also, the gaskets that are fitted between each pipe, they're super important. It's tough to form a flawless metal-to-metal -metal seal, so the gaskets are sandwiched between each connection to prevent the gases from escaping. The exhaust then travels down the system through interconnected pipes until it exits through the tailpipe near the back bumper. Pipes help cool off the exhaust, but they're mostly a way for the exhaust to travel to and through the catalytic converter and muffler. That's going to burn off and remove up to 90% of the exhaust toxins, and it's designed to have as little impact on the flow of air as possible. The muffler and resonator are usually situated right after the cat. The muffler looks like a big round or oval chamber, and it's responsible for silencing most of the engine's noise. It also has to allow the exhaust to continue flowing smoothly. That's a double duty. It's got to let the air flow while stopping the sound waves. It breaks the sound waves up by making them crash into each other. It's got all these chambers. Hey, let's all be really quiet. Take a look. Wow, that's really something. The resonator is a secondary or a substitute sound elimination component. In some cases, it can be used instead of a muffler. There's different combinations of these. Some soothe the exhaust as much as possible, and others are specifically tuned for loud and aggressive tones. You know, we can do a whole episode on resonators. There's a buttload of pipes in the exhaust system, each designed to connect to one another and shaped to conform to a specific part of the underside of the car. They're made like this because bending pipes is hard. Believe me, I try it all the time. It's easier to connect small segments than it is to shape one long pipe to fit every contour of a car. Also, you can replace components when they wear out instead of replacing the whole system. One of the byproducts produced is an acidic moisture. That's really damaging to the metal. So pieces of the system only last so long, even when they're well maintained. It's, it's hard to keep the inside of the pipes clean. Probiotics and fiber can help some. I switched to talking about my butt for a second. Aftermarket exhaust systems are super popular. A good one can improve throttle response, give a boost in horsepower, and even improve fuel economy. Performance exhausts are less restrictive than stock. The engine can push out more air. It also means it can pull in more air, and that helps the engine make more power. But contrary to what you might think, a free-flowing system is not always better. I've heard a few conspiracy theories out there that go all the way from the Vatican down to voodoo donors that say you need back pressure for an engine to work. That's not exactly true. Back pressure is naturally created at various points because of the nature of the exhaust design, but it's never desirable. Runners from each cylinder meet in a collector, basically a rapid expansion in a pipe diameter from a single pipe. When a cylinder exhaust pulse hits the collector, a refraction, low density pressure waves form, and that travels upstream back to the exhaust valves and decreases pressure at the valve. Depending on the length of the runners, peak performance shifts to different RPM range. You can also use the cylinder pulses from the other cylinders to help each other out and improve your scavenging performance. So why would back pressure be seen as helping? Basically, when people claim that a certain amount of back pressure is beneficial, they're probably mixing up back pressure and scavenging. That phenomenon where the movement of gases through the exhaust system creates a partial vacuum that can actually suck the exhaust out of the cylinder. Think of siphoning gas. Don't do it! Just think of it. All right, the pull of the gas in the front draws more gas from the back. In a perfectly designed exhaust, you're helping to pull the air through the engine. If the pipe's too big, you lose the effect. If it's too restrictive, the engine's got more trouble pushing the air out. A properly designed exhaust system maximizes this scavenging effect around a wide range of RPMs. A lot of times people who put a massive diameter exhaust or header, well, they'll see a drop in power because they've dropped the exhaust velocity significantly. And as a result, they lost some of the strength of the inertial effects of the exhaust because of slower gas speed. Oh, hey, let's check out the ultimate low restriction exhaust system, a top fuel dragster. Each cylinder gets its own exhaust pipe 
which, at roughly three feet long, only serves to get the exhaust up and away from the engine. In the process, using the force of the exhaust to create a little extra downforce to boost traction. Oh man, talking about all this exhaust sure is exhausting. <laughs> I am exhausted. Probably doesn't help that I always demand exhaust be pumped into the studio when we film. Hope you guys were all able to intake that information. <laughs> oh, that's why they pay me the big bucks. All Sacagawea, homeboys. Subscribe to Donut! Thanks to Fix for sponsoring the episode. Fix is a Bluetooth OBD2 reader that links up with your phone. You can click the link in the description to get 10% off with the code DONUT. And remember that Fix Mechanic hotline? They're offering Donut viewers a 10% discount on that service too! And Fix is new and improved! They've got enhanced error code detection, being able to detect manufacturer specific codes. So you can be more competitive with those high-end scan tools. And it does deeper diagnostics than it used to. So go to fixedapp.com and use the code DONUT at the checkout. Subscribe to Donut! This little button's to subscribe, click on it so you never miss a new episode. We got new stuff coming out almost every day of the week. Check out this episode of Wheelhouse, because it's really good. Check out this episode of Hot Lab. It's cool. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram, at Donut Media. Follow me, at Bids Bardo. Don't tell my wife that resonator didn't come with the car.